brothers and my sisters Only they can understand Fight this war together Together we will stand Hey everybody, it's Joe and thanks for tuning in to TVO Campfire. What this show's about is about successful veterans and they're bringing you the stories and their experiences. And we hope that it can provide inspiration to each of you out there, or maybe a veteran that you know to help in their life. Hey everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the TVO Camp for Fire. Today we got a uh, Texas phenom on our hands. <laughs> and, and I say that uh, loose terms and pretty lightly with uh, one of our TVO members, Logan Sinatsky. Uh, great guy down in, uh, he's in living down in the uh, big state of Stephenville on the big planet, Texas, and uh, amazing guy, loves the outdoors, and <laughs> uh, this guy right here, as soon as I, I've, I've seen him in the members group and seen him posting on social media about his adventures and what he does, and this guy is probably gone all over the state on his own two feet and part of North America. He's always hiking good places. Anytime that we're going to go hike in Texas, I, I'm calling this guy as my subject matter expert, as well as anything that's gear related for the outdoors, man. I'm calling this guy because I know he's already put it through the ringer. I know he's at least got his opinion and that's something I respect majorly. He played a little football down in Stephenville. Might have got him two state championships under his belt. Just maybe, just maybe. Uh, you know, he decided the Navy wasn't going to be quite something he could live up to. So he decided to go to the Army, you know, and uh, got to play around in the dirt, got to work with some dogs. Uh, I'll let him tell the, the rest of his story, but. He's got a good success story, which is why he's on the show today. So, Logan, welcome, sir. I'm glad to have you. Good to be here, Joe. Um, yeah, I was uh, you know, lucky to be on uh, two state championship football teams here in the cowboy capital of the world, Stephenville, Texas. And, uh, you know, went to college here, too. Um, decided that uh, when I was done with grad school that I wanted to take a look at what the army had to offer. So that's what I went and did. That's pretty exciting, but let's go back a little bit further so we can kind of see what led up to your decision to join. Did you grow up in Stephenville? I uh, moved here when I was two. So yeah, pretty much. Okay. And um, so you've been there the whole time. And when you, when you were growing up, did you have any family members that were in the military or kind of Influence. Both my grandparents, both my grandfathers were in the military. Um, mom wasn't, dad wasn't, but both my grand grandfathers. Were they close by you where you could sort of talk to them and get um, them? Somewhat. My dad's dad was in Lubbock, Texas, or Anton, really, which is a speck north of Lubbock. And then uh, my mom's dad was relatively close in Fort Worth for the most part. And were they also Army veterans? No, they were actually both Air Force. Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. So when did you learn the difference between Air Force and Army? Oh, uh, well, probably at a very young age. I was always interested in the military. So I knew the, I knew the different branches at a pretty young age. I couldn't tell you exactly when. It's amazing how young we are and we can still differentiate the different you know branches of service and so um i do think that many people at a young age can get an idea of them wanting to um, enlist or kind of move forward were you involved in any type of um 
programs in high school or anything that was military related? Um, no, not necessarily. Um, Boy Scouts is probably the closest thing that I was a part of to any kind of a military organization, I guess. I didn't do ROTC or junior ROTC. Well, I, I'll tell you what, with, uh, you know, being on a program like what Stephenville has developed into over the years, I, I wouldn't see how you had time to do anything <laughs> outside of that, but football. Um, and from what I know of Logan, he actually did very well in the scouts all the way up into his adulthood life. Um, expand on that, Logan, tell, tell, tell them what they don't know about you already yeah so i was a member of scouts through my whole life i uh i was active until i was 18 um actually kind of dropped the ball in my eagle scout project and didn't get it submitted in time and turned 18 before it got approved but i was also in the middle of winning a state championship <laughs> so there's different priorities at that stage in my life outdoors is just different than than it is in a lot of different other places so i really enjoyed that Gotcha, gotcha. Well, what's some of the stuff that you that you know has really stuck with you from your childhood that you know really helped develop you are into the person you're today outside of scouts and outside of football? Um, you know, I was lucky. I had um, both my parents are you know raised me and my sister great, um, strong work ethic. You know, we we didn't get allowances, we didn't get bought stuff. It was always okay. Well here are your chores, here's what you can do. And then you got paid basically to do, to work. Um, so I always grew up with a strong work ethic. Hey Logan. So you got the teamwork and the camaraderie and the adaptability down in football. You got the outdoors going with, um, the boy scouts and the leadership and the development kind of into young adulthood through that. Is there anything else that you felt in your childhood family related, maybe, you know, anything like that, that really, you know, sticks with you today and made you who you are? Uh, absolutely. My parents both um, instilled very strong work ethic in me and uh, my sister as well. And we were, you know, raised to, you know, never take for granted anything. We really just kind of make your own way, you know, you know, be, be in, be in charge of your own success. Don't don't rely on somebody else or or anything like that. Awesome, that's good stuff, man. And and it's glad to hear that. And we're finding out as the more and more we do this show and go back and kind of compare notes across all of them, these common denominators common denominators amongst people are really starting to add up for us, and it's starting to solidify, showing hey the people who have had really strong uh, success in their life, a lot of it stems back to the parents growing up and how the parents were involved and how the parents actually developed the child. Uh, did they influence at all your decision on when you decided that, Hey, I want to actually serve into the army? Yeah, I think they, well, mom tried to influence me against it. <laughs> dad was very supportive of it but and then you know once I, I think once I finally convinced my mom of what I was wanting to do then she she got on board but she was I think more just worried for her baby boy <laughs> so you knew what you wanted to do did you know what kind of MOS you wanted and how did that work when you took the ASVAB um, I, I, I 100% went in knowing exactly what I wanted to do. I, I had, uh, finished college. I was done with undergrad and grad school. And, um, I was at a point in my life where it was either, okay, jump into the corporate world or let's take a look at this, this one thing that's always been a scratch. I never, you know, um, or an itch I never scratched, I guess. And, uh, I decided that, uh, I was going in the army. I was 18 x-ray, which is special forces recruit. That's all I wanted to do. Um, I went into the recruiter. I said, here's my, here's my packet. This is it. Don't offer me anything else. Don't let me look at anything else. This is, this is where I'm want to go and what I want to try to do. Now, I was saying it, it's good to hear like somebody that came in and was basically like, Hey, this is what I'm doing or I'm not doing nothing at all. 
I mean, w did you have that mentality, uh, at least with the, the recruiters at the time? Or was it that you just said, hey, I want to do this, and they were, and they just kind of bowed down, you know, <laughs> if you will? Um, I think, you know, they, it was either that or and if, if that wasn't going to be an option, then OCS and then, you know, try to get into special forces that route. But I was already 28. So I was looking really for a faster way to get in. And so that's why I went in non-commissioned rather than in, in or, you know, enlisted rather than commissioned. It was just a it was a quicker route to get to selection. Whereas if you go OCS and then get on a, as a PL somewhere, a platoon leader, you know, you're looking at two or three years before you can even drop a packet for selection. So, um, and honestly, when I came in, I was in great shape. Uh, you know, my, my master's was in kinesiology um, with an emphasis in strength and conditioning. So I, I, they really didn't hesitate to just give me what I wanted. It was like, okay, I think it helps them if they can get an OCS guy, but they knew what I was there for, so. How long was your schooling once you got once you went through boot camp and um, and then you went on to school? How long how long was the training? Um, I just did, you know, um, if you're 18 X-ray, even if you're a special forces recruit, you're trained infantry. So um, just basic training and OSIT at Fort Benning. Uh, honestly, I don't even remember how long it was. Got there in June and I believe I was done in. October <laughs> may have been sooner than that. What was your total length of service? Um, I did a five year contract, which was the minimum to be for 18 x-ray MOS. Um, um, the, I guess the theory behind that is if you do make it through selection, then um, they don't want to lose you too, too quickly. You gotta, cause it's usually a two year process just to get on a team. So they want to try to get at least three years out of you once you're on a team. A lot of people think on the Navy side of the house, once you go through buds that and complete it, that all of a sudden, boom, you're a seal and hey, you're good to go and blah, 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 which that is not the case by any means. It's still quite a extensive uh, process before you even get your trident at all. Um, on y'all side of the house, is it similar to the same way? where once you complete that, you still have quite a few <laughs> more, yeah. more, you know, uh, evolutions to go through. Uh, Absolutely. Before you um, actually gain your status. Yeah, I, I, I didn't get the opportunity to go to any of that because I was non-select at selection. But if you are selected, you're looking at like language school and then your own MOS training inside the special forces. So I think it's another two years of training prior to getting to a team. Oh, yeah, wow. Yeah, and I mean, that's pretty interesting. And so once you you completed that, what was your actual MOS then? So if you're a non-select at selection, um, your really needs of the Army at that point. And only thing I was trained in was infantry. So I was sent to a light infantry unit. That's interesting. So in the five years that you were in, how many times did you end up getting deployed or being sent overseas? Twice. Um, I got to my unit and uh, they were already deployed in Iraq, actually. So um, I got to the unit, trained up a little bit and then met, met the unit in uh, Fallujah, Iraq while they were already there. And then I did Afghanistan later on. What was your role at that time in Fallujah? To me, Fallujah is still a bad word. It's a bad experience. Um, well, luckily, when I was sent to Fallujah, it was well past when it was really bad. It was, wasn't was a lot going on there. We were there mostly trained Iraqi army. Um, I was actually slotted for the scout team, which is a member of the HHC, which is headquarters, headquarters company. Um, we sat down with uh, Sergeant Major and Battalion Commander once we got in Fallujah. They found out I had a master's degree and I was immediately recruited to the Battalion Talk Tact Tactical Operations Center and um, became a 
RTO, which is radio telephone operator, but really a little more to that now. You're you're tracking battle maps and 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 teams and and platoons while they're out on mission and stay in contact with them. So um, that was all I did in 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 Iraq. All you did, oh my gosh, I'm sure that you did a lot more and um, you are really being modest about your experience there, but I do have a question and either of you can answer this or neither of you can answer this. It, you know, I'm not, I'm not even sure if this is a really fair question to ask, but I'm going to throw this out there. What are your thoughts on whether we should have trained Iraqis? Uh, I think it's a, honestly, it's probably a pretty practical approach to it. You don't, you're trying to set up a, a space to leave. You don't want a permanent presence there, but you also, you don't want any of the work you've done in that country to go to waste. So the best option is really train up local army and local police to at least somewhat do what you were doing there. So when you leave, there's not that drastic withdrawal of support from the, com the country. I just wasn't sure if maybe we, you know, the, your thoughts would be that it should come from our military or like a paramilitary organization um, that, you know, there's certain civilian organizations that do go in and um, do some things overseas. And I didn't know if maybe the thought was that should be left to another organization versus our military. I'll, I'll give you my straight up uh, just reality on it, right? When you raise that right hand and you speak that oath, you swear to that oath and you take that oath, that is to defend and support your freedom and your country and that and your fellow you know citizens of that country as well to me that's where it stops it stops on that oath at that point when you're utilizing active duty service members to train other countries to defend themselves and be able to do their own selves to me that's outside the oath so I really think that it should not be our active duty troops that is doing that training. Plus, you really look at the demographic of people over there fighting. Really, does somebody who has maybe two or three years or maybe two or three or four or five years experience in armed conflict, the right people that you want training an entire nation to defend themselves? I don't. And I don't want to put that on any of our, our young kids that's over there either. We train them to go to, buy, to war and then hopefully they come back safely. To me, that's where that stops. When it goes to training a nation of people to defend themselves, no. Let's bring in the retired guys. Let's bring in the ones like, you know, the Blackwater, those sort of organizations like that. Um, Yes, that should be done by outside entities who have decades of experience of this because they also know what to train and what not to train. Those folks will get over there and teach them the basics of police, of police. I say police work, but I know it's not. Um, they will get over there and teach them the basics of armed conflict just enough to defend themselves without giving away a lot of our... Uh, secrets of battle if you will and that's my concern also with the young kids the young kids don't have that experience enough to actually teach them the the very 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 basics because at that point a lot of that stuff for those kids are actually over there performing their daily life become their routine becomes their basic right and it also blurs that line between hey this is a basic tactic and this is an advanced tactic so <laughs> I think what you're saying is spot on. And that was my concern. And you addressed it because I was going to say about 
you know, our intel, our military intel can be jeopardized because who's vetting those that are signed up on the, in the other country? And is there, there can be things, inter people intertwined that are nefarious that go in there and there's no way to really know that and how much are we jeopardizing uh, of our intel. So I just kind of wanted to throw that out there, especially because the topic of Fallujah came up and the bad taste that it that it's got. But I know, Logan, this has been really, this has been an exciting journey for you because starting a little bit later in life has allowed you to look at things from a completely different perspective. And then also know that you're going to utilize specific things about your your training as you end up transitioning out of the military and going into the civilian workforce so with that after your two tours that you did and you had your five-year contract getting ready to come up were you involved with the transition assistance program or how did you begin your transition back into the civilian world yeah, transition back into the civilian world wasn't too difficult. Just, um, I think probably because I was older. Um, um, I was 31 when I got out. So, um, no, that isn't right. 33 when I got, <laughs> got out. So I, uh, I, I didn't really have the struggles and I, I had a lot of connections already established here in Stephenville um, cause I was here so long before I joined the army that, um, it was, it was pretty easy for me to move back and get my foot back in the door here. And at least in the job world, I had connections at Tarleton and, and that's where I started out at when I moved back was, um, I was adjuncting, um, adjunct teaching in the kinesiology department here at the university. <clears throat> and, um, so it was, it was not a difficult transition for me. Um, I know a lot of younger guys struggle with that because they they don't have any kind of a foundation to come back to for the most part. There's no previous work experience. There's no previous network that they have been a part of and can rely on. So that brings me to one of the questions I have because you had already went in with a degree in kinesiology, utilized those skills, you came back, you're an adjunct teacher at a university now, and you have the GI available, GI bill available to you. Were you able to, or have, do you have plans on utilizing that to further your education or maybe you, a, a different field? Um, you know, actually when I first moved back, that was the, the plan was to um, pursue my doctorate in physical therapy, which honestly was the whole reason I even got into kinesiology in grad school. Um, <laughs> I had to take some undergraduate upper level courses to submit an application for um, physical therapy school. And I struggled in those courses. Just I had been in a, a system for five years that was extremely disciplined and you, you, you were taught to, you know, be respectful of your, you know, your, your supervisors or, or, you know, your leaders, your team managers, your team leaders. Um, and then going back into a, a classroom with 19, 20 year old college kids who haven't really had any kind of life experience and seeing the way that they, they treated professors. And I mean, I was in a chem two class and it was hundred kids in there. And I think 90% of them were playing Fortnite or something on their laptops instead of listening to the professor. And it was, it was more distracting than it was anything else. And I wasn't, it wasn't a successful environment for me. Um, so I took a time out and that's pretty much, I was in that time out when I got the job I have now. Well, you've brought up something that I think is really important to talk about. And Joe, you may find this as well, but those in the current climate that we live in as far as college, and I saw this because I worked at a college myself, there has been 
a big discrepancy on how veterans learn versus the civilians that are learning at the college level. And many colleges are now placing veterans group or areas on campus for veterans to get together and work together because the learning environment is completely different than what we've been through. And what you said has been spoken many times that I've heard through veterans. I don't know, what do you think, Joe, about that? My personal experience, what I've seen and I'm witnessing right now is your veteran population that's going back through school, back through college, seem to be more extroverted. And then when you put them with these kids who have been, um, I want to say in a, a non-social bubble, meaning they just stayed indoors, they stayed inside playing video games or whatever um, throughout their childhood. They're, they seem to be extroverts in the video game, but in real life, they're introverts, if that makes sense. And now that you're putting them in a classroom and around vets who are majority are extroverted, man, you talk about some people shutting down walls being built up seclusion. You know, it's like, yeah, I can see why your vets study ping pong off of each other, feed off of each other, uh, get together in groups and, and really make it a success is because that's what they've just been trained to do for X amount of years of their career versus the college kid who did not have any type of upbringing like that and is so used to working solo. So that's been my experience with it. So that seems to be pretty standard what, what I've seen, what Logan, you've seen, Joe, you. And so for those who are watching or listening to the show and are thinking about going to college or look for the veterans resource on that campus so that you can get plugged in with the best way to make your educational um, journey a success. And that's all I'm going to say about that, I'm going to shift a little bit, Logan, and ask you, sit, with the transition, were you able to get plugged in with the VA right away? Or because of maybe Stephenville being a little bit smaller, has that been a little bit of a challenge? Yeah, that was that was a big challenge, actually. I, um, I had hurt my back really bad when I was in Afghanistan, so I was looking into VA disability when I got out and finally got it, but it took, it took me going to a private doctor, which luckily I had one that I've used here growing up and basically getting everything started there and then taking an already, you know, completed medical packet from him to them and then showing my, you know, medical history, military medical history, but there was nobody there like to, to help me through that process when I first got out. It was, it was basically do your own legwork. If you really, if you want that, you're gonna have to go track those people down. There's, there was no support system for, for that, that help from the VA that I was looking for. You know, it's, I don't wanna say it, it's, it, it hurts me, but it definitely frustrates me because look how much time and effort and money is spent into taking, in Logan's case, our soldiers and sending them over to go fight wars in other countries. And then when it's time for him to go home, how much is spent on getting him back home? And to me, it sounds like in his case, it was a big fat zero. You, you've said a phrase that's really important there and that's getting back home. And that isn't just physically, it's also mentally and sometimes getting back home for some of the veterans that I know we come across takes a long time. Especially in that area, like they know where he's going back to. 
you fill it out on all your DD two fourteen. Hey man, here's where to mail. You know, here's where here's where to mail stuff to. Right? They know where you're going. Was there any effort made at all to help link you with anything veteran related prior to getting out back in your well, obviously your hometown, but wherever you decided to go to, do you truly or did you truly get any help at all? With something simple as an email or a phone call of saying, hey, here's someone in your area to help when you get there. There was, there was nobody, like nobody that made any connection for me to anybody back here again that like i think they just expect you to do the work on your own now they they give you a whole packet of of you know organizations and people you can contact to help you but the army itself or probably the military in general i can't really speak for other services there was nobody there to say hey this is the person you need to talk to in that town that will help you reintegrate to home life it was just here's your packet best of luck and that was it so me hearing that you know as a president of a statewide organization to me this gives me opportunity you know how many times you've been you you heard you've been in a fight or you you hear of somebody in a fight and one of them says step up this ain't nothing but space and opportunity right here. Let's make it happen. You know, whatever. Right. And that's how I kind of see this. This here is space and opportunity for our organization to turn around and say, you know what? If we ever have a vet member that reaches out to us and say, Hey, you know, I'm transitioning it out. I'm going to be down in Stephenville, Dublin, Comanche, whatever. Now we have a person, you know, now we have one of our members down. Absolutely. Yep. I know a guy to call right now who can at least be a point of contact at a minimum. So that that really gives a, a good challenge to us as an organization going, okay, how do we reach out to those separate those those back to you know the branches of service saying for any vet that's coming back to Texas to utilize us as, as a simple phone call. So Logan, you, you gave us, you gave us some work to do. Just <laughs> thinking about this, just hearing this and thinking about this, man, it's uh, interesting. Yes. And how many and, veterans go back to a smaller town and they don't have close resources or other veterans to, you know, have the camaraderie with. And I think that this is where TVO comes in so well is by placing community leaders in different areas throughout the state so that they can, all of us can begin um, to unite together and really continue that. Because I do think it is, it is really difficult. And even when you go to a big city, there are, sometimes you can be this, you know, small fish in a big pond and not have everything that you need or the right connections. And th there's just a lot of different challenges, I think, that come with that. And I'm really glad that TVO is available to help. And I, I really like what you just said, Joe. Yeah, yeah, definitely it's, it, it's a challenge. And I'm glad that Logan, you know, is willing to be a, just a point of contact you know, if a vet's coming back down to that area saying, Hey, you know what? I went through, I, I went through the same thing. You know, this is what I did. Um, when you, when you got out, Logan, um, the job that you're in now, tell us about that. And was that your first job that you got as soon as you got out? No, it wasn't my first job. I, I again, I, I was adjunct teaching there for a little bit when I first moved back. Cause I was planning on continuing my education, which, um, then I got honestly just kind of fell into it. Um, a buddy of mine who's friends with the the CEO COO of this company um, kind of matched us up, and we started talking. Um, I have a 
you know, my dad was a real estate appraiser focused mostly on, on dairies and other, other ag um, properties to appraise. And so I was very, very versed in the dairy industry just from growing up in that, that world. And that's our primary um, product is for, you know, we work, you know, mostly in dairy, um, doing large, large facilities for them. Um, and we got to talking and realized we had a lot in common and um, he offered me a job and I was honestly at a point where, you know, education wise, I was a little frustrated because I wasn't, um, I wasn't being as successful as I thought I would be in, in, especially in those undergrad classes. Um, so I, I just jumped on it and now four and a half years later, you know, five this, this summer, um, I'm still working here. It's a great, great company, great family to work for. Um, and it, it's been a, it's been a blessing, honestly, that I just never saw it coming. How long have you been out now? Um, six years. Uh, I, I, I ETS'd in 2015 and started at prime in the summer of 2016. All right. So I know what it is. And please tell everybody out there, one, the name of the company, and two, exactly what you do. Because to me, if you're in Texas and you're retiring and you're getting ready to settle down, develop, maybe develop some land, build your place, whatever, this is a guy you're going to want on your team. I'm telling you now. Yeah, so I work for uh, Prime Metal Buildings. Um, we're out of Dublin, Texas. Um, I'm the pre-engineered metal building sales manager here. Um, and the hot commodity right now for everybody is uh, barn dominiums. You want, a, you want a metal building, a metal house on your property? Um, we do a ton of it. Um, you can check us out on Facebook. We put a lot of them up there. Um, and you can just search Prime Metal Buildings. We don't have an Instagram yet, but I think we're working on that. Um, our website is just uh, www.primebldg.com, like short for building. Um, yeah, if you if you need to reach out, my, all my contact info is on the website. Um, I can definitely get you pointed in the right direction. I'm actually walking my parents through the process right now. And I say you're going to want him on your team because this, this ain't just no metal building by no means. <laughs> Once you see what people and these folks are, are, are doing with the housing shortage that is going on right now in the DFW Metroplex alone, you are going to be amazed going, why did I never think of that? <laughs> um, my network is a lot of is a lot of pilots that are getting out and retiring. Um, they're taking these things, and you know we've known it we've known it for years. They're called hangar homes, if you will. Um, but it's literally building a hangar right there on you know on the side of the runway, pull the plane right up into, and then when you walk into the hangar and you're like, hold on, this is more than just a hangar. This it, and they have them immaculate. Some of them are two and three story living spaces inside the hangars. And then once you, st you sit down and you like, you start doing the cost per square foot to do that versus what a home would actually cost at that. It's, it's mind blowing and baffling. And I've even, so just listening to some of the people that have done it, Logan, I've, I'm literally hearing that by doing the barn dominium style homes, people, some people are paying as low as 20 to 20 to 28 percent range of what it would normally cost them to do a, a conventional home of that same size. Yeah, the, uh, the, um, is there's some stuff that keeps that price down. Obviously, um, if you've got a super complicated design for your your residence, it's it's not going to pencil the same way wood would. But if you have a you know 
pretty straightforward design. Then, as far as just your overall floor plan layout goes, your really your, your your meat of your building, then it can save you a lot of money, um, especially as high as wood prices are right now. And, and not only that, but the construction price too. Um, and that's what we were looking at for the organization. We were looking at how long it was going to take. Like we're on we're, right now, if we were to build conventionally um, at some land that we had donated to the organization, if, if we were to build on that land conventional style um, housing, if you will, we were on a eight month wait list just to get a crew out there, not including the time it was going to take, which was almost uh, 11 to 11 to a 15 month build for that crew once they started. So this is turning into a two year project just to build a place <clears throat> for vets to get out and go to. <clears throat> and I'm going that to me, that's ridiculous. But then I hear everything Logan's got going on. And if you, if you were to take say a, a 4,000 square foot building, Logan, how long would it take a crew to put that thing together? from the foundation up? Um, as far as turnkey finish out, I can't speak much for that because that's a little outside of my um, outside of my wheelhouse. As far as your shell, you could get that thing dried in in probably two weeks. We're adding on to our office facility here. Um, they stood frames, um, put studs in and got a roof all on in two weeks, so. Hey, that's just incredible. That's, uh... Yeah, yeah. Uh, boom, done. <laughs> Amazing. Well, I tell you what, man. Uh, I thank you for coming on, sharing your quick story. Uh, one thing I want you to tell them about that we lost during the uh, the disconnection process there with you. I want you to just go back, tell them what you did involving the dogs and <laughs> and how that came and how that came into play. Because yeah, that's one so, of our, that's to me, that's one of our most overlooked parts of the military. And that, and that actually carries on quite a bit of life skills in post-military career. Yeah, prior to our deployment to Afghanistan, um, we're getting ready, we're getting spun up. They selected two, three guys from every company inside the battalion to send to a dog training school. It's a TED program that's tactical explosive detector dogs. Um, <clears throat> basically, you know, you're not a dog handler, but they send you off to get trained to be a dog handler for the next two or three months. And then you, once you complete the program, you link back up with your unit downrange in Afghanistan. And your primary objective is to you know, find IDs or hopefully not find them if they're, hopefully they're not there, but um, if they are, um, find them and, uh, you know, call in the right people to get them taken care of. So, you know, we were, uh, we were dismounted. We were light infantry in Afghanistan. So every combat mission we were on, we were walking. Um, and me and the point guy ran hand in hand and my dog, he worked up to a hundred yards off leash. Um, out in front of us and uh, basically just searching right in front of us everywhere we were walking uh, to make sure that, um, you know, we were safe. And so um, luckily the whole time I was there, um, we had no injuries or, or, or deaths obviously um, that were attributed to IEDs in our, in our platoon. i tell you what, man, that is one, one very respectable, profession that I that I have and the reason being is because if you've ever worked with a dog tried to train them it's really the human that ends up needing training not really the dog because dogs have that natural instinct in them to serve and protect which to me is amazing it's just a matter of understanding how to get that out of them you know and humans obviously is the same way right <laughs> how as a leader how do you get your team to perform the best that it can and be the most efficient right 
and so those folks that can turn around and do that with with the dogs man it, it's amazing and i i do think that that's one of the most untapped professions slash skill sets in our military are the handlers because those people have lots of patience they have lots of understanding they have lots of adaptability and at the end of the day they have to perform that mission with a team member and when we get i, I see it all the time just in our organization a lot of the people get out don't know how to convert those skills over to actual professional skills or basically how do you how do they how do you sell that you know well i was a dog handler you know blah 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 no man you you were so much more than that because if you had the patience to sit down and, and go through a real world event on a daily basis like that in that type of environment and that dog was your teammate I really think a good 90 to 95 percent of those people that do that would end up being some of your best mid-level to executive managers that corporate America can have. Just my take on it. But Logan, thanks for the time today. Um, I, I definitely appreciate that. One, what you're doing. Two, how you're doing it. And even though you came in and had a short career, you know, with the army, you know, I, I, I tell you what, man, whether it was one day or it was a hundred days or a thousand or 10,000 days, man, it's very meaningful. And I'm glad to see that you're one of the people in Texas, especially with our organization who can turn around and take what you did, bring it back to your community but also continue to help vets just like you're doing here. You're about to help vets on a global basis with this, what you're doing on this show. So little Stephenville, Texas is about to go extend a lot further out than just Stephenville with what you did here today on this show. But oh, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And Rebecca, please close us out. <laughs> Thank you so much for being with us and sharing your story, Logan. I know that I have found so much value in what you shared. And I know that those who are listening in and are tuning in and watching the show are going to gain some new insight. And, and I just thank you. Thank you guys for having me. It was, uh, it was actually, uh, <laughs> An honor to be invited on. Um, I, I love what the organization does. Otherwise, I wouldn't be a part of it. Um, and, you know, I'm going to try to keep keep helping as best I can. That That's what I want to do. Um, it's nice being involved with, with good people and, and a good or organization. Fantastic. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in, both on the TV side and the audio side of the house, we wanna ask that you share this with all the veterans that you know, and even those who are on active duty that are getting ready to transition out or just they're still in, we'd like to get as much information and resources in the hands of all of you who have served or are serving. And so do share this on social media and on every platform that you can. So thanks for tuning in. We really appreciate you as well. Well, we're veterans, so we spend a lot of time in mental health. Um, <laughs> Thanks for telling me. Just us. part of it, right? And uh, so, and we also teach a class called, uh, now it's called Rec for Heroes. It's a guitar class at the VA, uh, Fort Worth VA. And I've been teaching now for now five years, and, and Ron has been helping me teach the disabled vets up there. And um, so I said, I got to thinking, you know what? The song is essentially three minutes with your therapist, right? I mean, it can make you up, make you down, whatever. So I uh, wrote a little bit about it, and Ron is like, yeah, let's finish that song. Yeah, so we sit down and. It's called finished, Three Minutes of. And we finished it in a thunderstorm. Yeah, that's so. right. Give me a three minute session with my favorite Haggard song. Warm summer evening and the rumble of a storm. Find my direction, way to heal my wrongs with a three-minute session.
Washington in the form of a country song. Now therapists, they try their best an hour to work on you. Ask you questions, search for answers, take away your blues. I ain't saying that they don't help. One thing I know is true. One quick way to brighten my day is listen to my favorite tune. Give me a three-minute session. With my favorite Leland song Warm summer evening And the rumble of a storm Find my direction Way to do my wrongs With a three minute session In the form of a country song With my favorite Patsy song Warm summer evening And the rumble of a storm Find my direction Way to heal my wrongs With a three minute session In the form of a country song Give me a three minute session with my favorite bowling song A warm summer evening And the rumble of a storm Find my direction Way to heal my wrongs With a three minute session In the form of a country song Find my direction Way to heal my wrongs with a three-minute session in the form of a country song.